as we have come into your house to be in your presence with the world shut out we claim the sentinels of your angels around this place that nothing of this world can penetrate into this sanctuary that in this your house your will will be done as it is done in heaven that your voice will be heard to the power of your Holy Spirit that surely you will set us apart for a holy use fitly transformed to be able to speak words when we leave this house revealing that we have been in your presence we've come because you've given us the right where we claim the blood of your son his life to be ours empower us with your Holy Spirit Lord teach us pour out Glorify your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's not by happenstance that just the one sang that song today. we are going to address a challenge from God. We need to ask ourselves that question, are we playing games at the cross? The title for today, Mental Power for Strength Unto Sanctification. In one sense, this is a summary of the last 20-some sermons discussing the Day of Atonement. For without mental power, sanctification is impossible. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God even your sanctification. It is clear, I pray to all, that it is God's design that our lives be set apart for holy use. For the purpose to bring glory and honor to His name. As we begin today, I'm going to just bring our minds backwards one week to the quotation that we began with last week to remind us if we are content. In other words, in one sense, it is asking us the question are you content meaning are you Laodicean because a Laodicean is always very content with where they're at if we are content to take a low level in Christian life the truth will never become wrought into a deep experience. As we begin today, we need to ask ourselves the question, how serious were we this week in loving present truth? Are we guilty before God because we have not been willing to love the truth 
in a deeper experience as He has called us to love it. Never forget 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11. Because they received what? No. Not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For what? For this cause. What's the cause? For not loving the truth. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. <coughs> now, this strong delusion, does it have truth in it? Yeah. Yes. How much truth does a strong delusion have? A lot. A considerable amount. So much to so that we may consider it truth when it isn't. This is why it's important to never forget these verses. You see, when we actually love the truth, it will be shown in our everyday lives without force or design but from the natural inclinations of our character will bring forth the present truth we hold in faith. The question has to be asked, do you really know what the definition of present truth is? Well, guess what? You get that next week. <laughs> because if you haven't figured it out over the last 20 sermons, you're going to get a review next week. We must hold this faith close to us, assimilated into our lives, that it may be lived out in our lives. Not only in our lives, but a blessing to others, bringing honor and glory to our Heavenly Father in Heaven. But remember, God tells us how much is involved. There is a work for us to do. A stern, earnest work. All our habits, all our tastes, all our inclinations must be educated in the harmony with the laws of life and health. By these means, we may secure what? The very best physical conditions. And what else? Mental clearness to discern the evil and the good. In other words, when the strong delusions come in the midst of us as a people, we will be able to say, no, that is an error in it. That is fully truth. We will be able to discern the deception. We'll be able to discern the right way without any reservation because we will have what? Mental clearness. That's what sanctification does. It's the work of sanctification brings into our lives the blessing of mental clearness. For what purpose? To discern evil and good truth from air. What is of eternal value? What is of worldly fantasy? All of these things are imperative that we understand what God is offering. You see, in today's society, the world, the vast majority are what's called mentally challenged. Yeah. Yes. They are. They don't know it. But they are mentally challenged. 
Think about it. How many do you know that can easily do simple math in their head? It's a rarity. Walk up the street, go to the grocery store, and ask someone a simple math problem. Uh, I don't know. And they'll give you an answer. But it's a wrong one. Why is that? Well, for 30 some odd years, you either used a calculator or a better calculator or a computer or not your phone. Not at all. It's an extremely difficult thing to find people who know how to add and subtract, much less multiply and divide in their head. Memory verses have disappeared from Sabbath school class. Why? One could say laziness or something else because nobody wants to memorize anything. Because they don't take the time is correct. You see, it's a lot easier to watch video games or TV by the hour instead of reading a simple book is almost extinct. Although I will have to admit that starting to come back with some trying to make it because now you have your e-reader and you can you can have your book on an e-reader and you can you don't have to have the actual book but you can you know you can read it that way and so now that's a new fad to read on my e-reader but just don't lose power because then you might not be able to read anymore I thank God for how he has been increasing my library lately to have the actual book even though I have them all on a computer you see, we live in the instant gratification lifestyle of this world. And even places such as Africa and India and other places of the world where Americanization may not be as prevalent, there is still the want of self-centeredness. The want it now mindset that has brought many into grasping at world passions and rejecting God's design. Everything we've discussed so far in the duty of the congregation on this antypical day of atonement is endeavoring to learn how and what God desires for us in our daily lives and how it affects our spirituality. Turn to John chapter 14. We're going to do some sword drill here for a few minutes. So just remember that you are going to be flying through a few verses in the Bible right here. John chapter 14. You see, we're on the subject of mental power for strength unto sanctification. We need to be educated by the Spirit for he is given by God. John 14, 26. Can someone who's got, who's got it and wants to read it today? Read out loud, nice and loud, so everybody can hear it even online. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. What's what I have said unto you? Yeah. Now this is very clear verse in Scripture, but the fact of the matter is, is if we don't study it beforehand, can He bring to remembrance something we haven't studied? No. Nope. No. So if we don't take the time to study during the week, when the teacher asks a question, we go, oh, I don't know, because we probably because we haven't studied it. And so we need to learn about them, those aspects. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. You see, we need to be taught by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is, did, did what? 
Philippians chapter 2 we're going to. What did the Holy Spirit do? It inspired the words of, the, of God's Word, right? Yes. So who would be the best person to teach us what God's Word says? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God which inspired the Bible to be written in the first place. This Holy Spirit, He's a busy guy. And we don't want to ignore Him. Philippians 2 verse 5 says what? Anybody have that real quick? Read it out loud. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ, which is also in Christ Jesus. All right. Let this mind. What kind of a mind did Jesus have? Spiritual mind. A spiritual mind. Yes. What kind? What What kind of a mindset did he have? God's mindset. God's mindset. He had God's agenda. His Father's agenda, not his agenda. He always put himself in subjection to his Father. And so when it says, let this mind be in you, the mind of Jesus, the simple, unreserved trust in the Heavenly Father. Now let's go back in the Bible farther to Titus chapter 1. And let's look at Titus and see what he has to say. You see, do we really seek to have it brought into our minds and into our lives practically? Or do we just like a good sermon? Titus 1 and verse 15 and 16. Titus 1. Verses 15 and 16. Who hasn't read that wants to read today? Sister Helen, if you would read real loud for us. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto and unto every good work reprobate. Wow, what a people! Wow. They got a profession, but what is it? Unpure. Totally unpure. They profess they know God. But in how they act, they deny Him. You see, we must plead with God for the pure life before Him. Amen. To have the mind of Jesus trusting ever in our Heavenly Father, always, never faltering, never staggering at the reality of life and our condition before Him and what He's asked us to be. Here we, be, we will begin to open a revelation of a huge blessing God designs that sanctification will bring into the lives of His people. The servant of the Lord puts it this way. Above all other people upon the earth. Now, starting right out there, does that get your attention? This is talking about a group of people above every other group of people above all other people upon the earth, the man whose mind is enlightened by opening God's Word to his understanding will feel that he must give himself to diligence in the pursuit of the Word of God. Amen. To a diligent study of the sciences. For his hope and calling are greater than who? Any other. Any other person. He has everything in its right perspective. He realizes that God's direction is the way to go. His priorities are correct. And then it says, this is some of the conditions, this is some of the reality of God of studying the Word of God. 
the more closely connected the man is to the source of all knowledge and wisdom, the more he can be advantaged, what? Intellectually. Intellectually. Now that means something. <laughs> as well as spiritually. spiritually through his relation to God. You know, it was someone who trusted the Word of God when the scientist said the world is flat. And if you go far enough, you fall off into the abyss. Mm -hmm. But he, 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 he saw the Word of God say that it was a sphere. And that's what led him to believe that he could dry, go west and end up east because the world was a sphere, not a flat surface. And that's how we basically had the Americas found was because of the Word of God said that the world was round and not flat. Amen. Now what else does the, world tell, the Word of God tell you? That scientist says, no, this is the way it is, but the Word of God says, what about creation? Yes, yeah, starts with very much how we exist, where we come from. Scientist tries to, to prove we come from a little speck and that. But God says, no, I spoke it into existence and then I formed man. Note the benefits God has offered. Above everyone in the world, God's people is given the vantage point no one else is allowed to have. Not that they can't have it. They won't have it. Because they aren't at the real source. Mark chapter 12. We're going to go there in just a minute. Mark chapter 12. See, not that they cannot experience it, but that unless a person is totally surrendered into God's sovereign will, it will be impossible to understand the things of God. The mind is enlightened by close connection with God's holy word. And if we are not connected, we aren't going to have a vision of the truth. The mind becomes intellectually advantaged. Instead of mentally challenged, you're mentally excelling. The spirituality is heightened through the Word of God. So why would you not want to serve Him? Why would you not? You see, serving God means unreservedly is asking too much by the majority. Oh, I want to put God in a box. I want to have my religion box over here, but don't let it affect the rest of my life. Let me do what I want to do, but just give God His time and I'll take mine. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Let me know when you found it. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with what? All thy strength. This is the first commandment. Now we did a series on the first, second, third, and fourth commandment. And we opened up a whole lot of what that really means. And that's putting God first in every way possible, isn't it? But do we? Have we been applying that? Because it's serious. We need to apply those principles daily. Daily when we are fully surrendered, we will find our lives need more and more purging from this world 
and from our desires But do we really want to get that serious? <laughs> Are we really wanting to cherish some things? Because we know we have a good idea of what we need to surrender, but do we really want to surrender it? You see, when we live this verse, we will recognize our complete inability to accomplish in our strength anything in His glory. Without complete surrender to His will and empowerment by the Holy Spirit, we will never be able to love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. We will not be able to do it. How much time have we spent in seeking God's view in our relationship to Him? Do we just presumably think that we've got it all lined up? That because we are in a present truth church and because we believe in the Sabbath, because we know that Christ is coming soon, we've got it all lined up. Our characters are right with God. And so we presume that everything is okay. Or do we spend time soul searching and saying, Lord, is there some place, is there something that I'm not remembering that I've got to deal with? Because remember, we may forget, but God didn't. And worse still, Satan doesn't either. You know, sometimes we, we, we act like Satan doesn't have a very good memory. <laughs> when it comes down, push comes to shove, and he wants to really push a button, he knows which one to push if you haven't had it confessed. Amen. He knows what you've confessed and what you haven't. Mm -hmm. And He'll test you on what you've confessed, but He'll hold that secret thing, <coughs> that thing that you've forgotten about, mm -hmm. the thing that you've ignored for the most crucial time in your spiritual walk with Him. And well, out it comes and boom! You go, what was that? Where'd that come from? Because you weren't at the altar. You didn't ask the Lord to reveal it to you before it came. You weren't really serious with God. And out it comes at the wrong time. And now you have to go back and you have to say, I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize. Please forgive me for how I acted. Now how easy it would have been to deal with that beforehand? You see? There's going to come a time when there's not going to be a time of repentance. Amen. And now you're lost eternally because you didn't do the homework. See, God gives us homework. It's called probation. Christ died for you You are to live as unto God. We need to let your reasoning powers, let my reasoning powers, refined, purified, sanctified, be brought to God. The Lord requires the sanctification of the whole person. Everything that you are, everything that you hope to be, past, present, and future, sanctified. The mind as well as the whole body is to be elevated and ennobled. God has claims upon the mind. He has claims upon the soul. He has a claims upon your body. And no, this is not talking about some floaty spirit out there. The definition of the soul here is not some spirit ghost. This is your character. This is who you are. 
God has claims on them. God has claims on them. God requires. It's not optional. Look at the quotation. Our high calling, page 43. This is the only place in the whole sphere of prophecy this, was, this quotation was put. This is another one of those quotations where they brought it out of the archives and put it in this book. It's the only place it can be found. God requires. It's not optional. He requires what? The whole being to be sanctified. God claims all of our lives, not part and parcel, as we decide. He makes it real easy. Give me everything or don't give me anything. Come all the way or stay away. Because when you don't give him anything, you're still irreachable. But when you say, oh, I'm just satisfied with where I'm at, God can't reach you then. Oh, I've got enough spiritual things in my life. I'm a spiritual person. I don't, I don't need God anymore. No, God says, give me everything. God claims all that we are. To think or to act in any way that would give credence to us not needing our entire being devoted to Jesus would be to have a profession recorded by God as false. Imposter. Enemy. Warring against God. We must have the desire of seeking His will first and only in our lives. The divine teacher leads the mind of the humble seeker for truth. And we need to ask God, show us where the humble seeker is. Show me where the person that's seeking your will. Because they're out there in the community. Show me, Lord. The humble seeker by the Holy Spirit's guidance, the truths of the Word are made known to Him. And there can be no more certain and efficient way of knowledge than to be thus guided. The promise of the Savior was when He, the Spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a person. It is the most humble person in the universe. Did you know that? Think about it. Who is the Holy Spirit? The third person of the Godhead. Does the Holy Spirit speak of Himself at any time? No. No. No, He doesn't. He serves humanity and He serves the other two persons of the Godhead. But He speaks nothing of Himself. He takes a back seat to everybody. Have you thought about that? Now, what, are, what is the characteristics of the Holy Spirit? Same as the Father and Son. Same as the Father and Son. So that means He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. And He's omnipresent. Immutable, eternal. Immutable, eternal. Invisible. Invisible. And the fact of the matter is, he is equal with the Father, yet he says, I'm going to take a back seat and give everything to you, Dad. Everything to you, Father. Everything to you, Son. Whatever you want me to say, that's okay, I'm going to say it. 
Oh, you want me to work for this, this person over here? I'm going. All of my power is going to that person. Oh, you want me to come over here and work with this person? Yeah, I'm coming over there, Lord. You see what I'm talking about? Now that's awesome. To be God and be so humble. Now that's the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so blasphemy to say that He doesn't exist. Because that is the gift of the Godhead that brings us into the nature and have the partaking of the divine nature in us. Amen. To say, I don't want that third person of the Godhead. He doesn't exist. You're cutting yourself off. Wow. That's serious. It is through the impartation of the Holy Spirit that we are made to understand the Word of God. And as we said before, the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God. So why wouldn't the best person to teach you the Word of God, the same person who inspired it? He longs to teach us with His Holy Spirit. But unless we are sincerely seeking for His truth, our weak profession is dead. And not just dead, but eternally dead. We can be like Daniel, for he offers to make us to understand if we are seeking. And then the Father goes even farther and offers a blessing of sanctification that is literally unparalleled. And when I read this quotation for the first time, I'm going, wow, why hasn't anyone preached it before? But think of it. Signs of the Times, February 11th, 1886. Write physical habits. Promote mental superiority. Amen. Now, we have one gentleman here that is going, two gentlemen that are going to school. Think about this quotation. Right physical habits. In other words, when you trust the Holy Spirit and God the Father and God the Son in the laws of your being, the eight laws of health, not just one diet, but all eight in your life, God is saying, I'm going to give you mental superiority. Now what does that say about your grades? Now that's a promise you can go home with. God says, put me first in your life and I'll give you mental superiority. Like you Daniel. Just like Daniel. Intellectual power. Physical strength and longevity depend upon immutable laws. There's no happen so. No chance about this matter. There's nothing but clear, thus saith the Lord. Heaven will not interfere to preserve men from the consequences of violation of natural laws. Nature's law. Nature's laws. The natural laws of our beings is what it's talking about. And then the prophet of God says this. There is much stirring truth in an adage. Every man is the architect of his own fortune. 
Ellen White was quoting somebody. And until this week, I never even knew this guy existed. Ampius Cadius Cacus. Who lived as a politician, a Roman politician, in 273 B.C. But God said, quote him, Every man is the architect of his own fortune. In other words, you can choose to follow God or you can choose not to. And the results will come by your choices. Directly, God is warning us, follow the laws of your being and receive the benefits. But if you choose to serve the animal passions of life, of the carnal nature. God will not interfere with its results. Now, pop quiz. Why will God not interfere to preserve men with the consequences of the violation of nature's law? Why will he not interfere? I have one hand. Do I have two? I two have two hands. Do I have three? <laughs> okay. Because if, he, if heaven did interfere, he'd be condoning sin. That is correct. And the other one says, yeah, that's right. <laughs> if God interfered, he would be condoning sin. Will God ever condone sin? No. No, he will not. So don't go to God and say, God, I need to be healed of this. I know I've been in, insubordinate to your nature's, the laws of my being, but I still need to be healed. I'm sick. We better first be asking for forgiveness and a purification of our past foolishness of violations against His laws. And if He chooses to heal us, bring glory and honor to His name because otherwise you will lose eternity. Amen. Are we playing games with God? Claiming to be Seventh-day Adventist but refusing to abide by the health message? Thinking we can be superior spiritually because of the doctrines that we profess to believe? All we give is a mockery to Adventism unless we take it all the way with health, spiritual, physically, mentally, and morally. Amen. If you want to serve God with all your heart, with all your mind, God will raise your life above the frailty of humanity Amen. and bring honor to His name. But don't be playing games with God. Sure. <clears throat> it could cost you eternally. Amen. Seek to be the blessing to others as you have been called to be. Seek to reveal the light of heaven where He leads you to daily walk. Note this. It is through the social relations that Christianity comes in contact with the world. That's true. Don't be afraid to associate with people who don't believe like you. Just make sure you keep it in the right context and the right priority. Don't be socializing just to socialize, in other words. Go for with an agenda to share your Heavenly Father. Every man or woman who has received the divine illumination is to shed light on the dark pathway of those who are unacquainted with the better way. Social power. Sanctified by the Spirit of Christ. In other words, there are certain things you're not going to go to the, to, the, to the bar or the strip club down the street 
for a social interaction. Why? Because it's not <clears throat> sanctified by the Spirit of God. <laughs> okay? But wherever you can go, wherever Christ... Now, I will say that, that if you are driving by and the Holy Spirit, and you better make sure it's the Holy Spirit, tells you to go into a place, well, sanctify yourself and go in, but don't go in there and stay. Go in there to find the person you're supposed to find. A minister was one time going by a, a bar and he literally heard the voice of God said, go here. There's my child is in there. He walked in. And as soon as he walked in, he recognized the drummer. And the set was just finishing that they were performing. And the drummer saw the pastor, and his face got white. And he says, what are you here? He says, the Holy Spirit told me to come and get you out of here. <laughs> now that man's got a choice. Because it may be the last time. So if you're going to go in, you better make sure you're going in for a purpose. Social power sanctified by the Spirit of Christ must be improved in bringing souls to the Savior. Christ is not to be hid away in the heart as a coveted treasure. Sacred, sweet, to be enjoyed by me. We are to have Christ in us. A well springing forth of water to everlasting life. Refreshing all who come in contact with us. In other words, we should have a spirit about us to bring joy. Because there's a lot of misery in this world. You see, God has created us as social beings. And when we are filled with the Spirit, our lives will be a sweet savor in this world of strife and chaos. People will be refreshed and always pointed to heaven's viewpoint. They will be brought in contact with a calm confidence rarely experienced in today's violent world. And if you don't think it's violent, you haven't listened to the news just this week, where if I'm not mistaken, three schools were attacked by gunmen. Not just one, but three. The Spirit of God is... is quickly being removed and children even 11 years old taking guns into the school and killing each other. It's serious. We must have, we must first have that passionate desire to know, to understand and apply heaven's truth in our own lives. Not just once in a while. Not just when we find it convenient to do it. But daily. <coughs> Let all seek clear understanding of the Scriptures. To see that the living Savior is your Savior. That you are following in His footsteps. Mm -hmm. Cultivate piety, humility mm -hmm. of mind. Combat intellectual laziness and spiritual lethargy. Mm -hmm. Lethargy. 
it is extremely easy to be intellectually lazy. It is easy to be spiritually lethargic in today's society. The question remains with each one of us. Do you want to guard against this malady? Or are you satisfied in the laziness of sin? Hosea 4.6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will what? Reject you. Ezekiel 33.11 As I live. Now, wow, when God says, as I live, what kind of an oath is that? Eternal. It's immutable. It's indestructible. It's eternal. That's how he lives. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God does not take pleasure in destroying his creation. So grab hold of this promise from God's to his prophet. God does not ignore ignorant men. Now we have a lot of stupidity in this world. People who think they know it all when they really don't know anything in the light of God's Word. So remember, claim this, God does not ignore ignorant men. But if they are connected with Christ, if they are sanctified through the truth, they will be constantly gathering knowledge by exerting every power to glorify God, they will have increased power with which to glorify Him. Claim it. You may not have went to the best schools in town. You may not even have went to a college or not. But when you say, Lord, I'm going to connect to you. I want you to teach me. I want you to empower me. I want you to strengthen me. Because I know that you want to glorify your name through my life because you've called me. Amen. You've saved me through your son. We must be willing to be taught. I like the saying, if you're willing to be taught, God can fix anything in our lives. Amen. The problem is, are you willing to surrender to Him? Every one of us has a past filled with demonic influences. We may not like to hear this, but demonic forces have influenced our lives. And it is our choice whether we guard against them and have them destroyed by God, their effectiveness destroyed in us, or we satisfied with a profession be destroyed eternally. Think about it. You see, God has given us more than enough to attain perfection in this sinful world environment. The promise is stated again as we began. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. We must place ourselves where we can draw from the inexhaustible source of power and strength. We are promised intellectual power unsurpassed by the sinful world around us. Moral efficiency and intellectual greatness can be our reputation before all men if we would just seek daily, moment by moment, our Heavenly Father and His sovereign will for our lives. Remember, do not put off the need of health reform in your life. Because with presumption, 
It's just, I don't get sick. Does not prove you're not sickly. Our sanctification, God's way, depends upon our cooperation with Him implicitly. Not where we can take it and leave it. It is not possible for us to glorify God while living in violation of the laws of health. The laws of our life. The heart cannot possibly maintain consecration to God while lustful appetite is indulged. A diseased body, a disordered intellect, because of continual indulgence in hurtful lust, make sanctification of body and spirit how much? Impossible. Impossible. Written in 1878. It takes perseverance to gain what many of us have lost in our lives. It's not easy and will not get easier, but we must press forward asking, pleading with God for strength of mind, body, to live in His design for our lives and our bodies physically, mentally, spiritually. That we will be the witness He is longing for His people to be. Note this stark warning. We have not pressed forward to the mark of our prize, of our high calling. Self has found too much room. Oh, let the work be done under the direction of the Holy Spirit. The Lord demands all the powers of the mind and being. It is His will that we should be conformed to Him in will, in temper, in spirit, and in our meditations. The work of righteousness cannot be carried forward unless we exercise implicit faith. Move every day under God's mighty working power. The fruit of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. Amen. Powerful statement. Powerful statement. Have we not pressed? Self and the spirit of self is not removed from the practical aspects of our life. You see, we may profess to be dead to self, and yet, do we individually, in our personal lives, have we really conformed to our Sovereign Father's will in our temper, in our spirit, in our meditations. To exercise implicit faith is calling higher than humanity without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can really conceive. You can't really conceive what God is calling you to do or to be unless you have the Holy Spirit teaching you. Are we guilty of listening week after week to the high calling of God's will and then never spend the time in studying as a Berean those things spoken here in God's house? I was talking to a sister on the phone this week. She was just learning about us and she said, I was listening to watching one of the sermons, and the sermon got done, and she says, I immediately took all my notes and my Bible and, and, my, and the Spirit of and I started opening it up and started going like a Brian, figuring out, is this guy telling me the truth? 
Because if he is, I got some things to change. But what about us here? Do we take the time to be like a Berean? Are we little gaining present truths to be assimilated into our lives, into our minds, and applied into our lives? Do we sit at the table in God's house and eat the spiritual food? And just, or just, uh, just uh, enjoy the aroma of being here? Never really masticating the meal that was presented. Digesting all the nutrients of it. You see, you can't masticate the sermon unless you study it after you leave God's house. True. Think about it. You see, we must be willing to set our personal lives after God's order and not man's agenda. We must be willing to press our minds and our bodies into a state of subjection, first and only to the will of God, and all things at all times. We cannot presume to allow our lives to be so filled with this world that present truth is not learned and meditated upon and studied and applied and only taking fleeting moments if we're not too sleepy and exhausted. You see, ever we are to seek God's face. Daily listen for His voice. Now while probation is still available. Soon and very soon it's going to close and then there's no change in character to be had. We must take it seriously. But the question is, as we close, have you counted the cost? Have you really had that inventory of your life taken by the Holy Spirit? Are you counting the cost every day? Are you choosing life eternal with those choices? Or are you choosing by default eternal extension and death? Count the cost. Carefully examine. Trust your Heavenly Father. For God is faithful. He will finish what He began in you. What you ask Him to begin in you, He will finish it. For Christ in you is the hope of glory. Amen. The reality is we need to ask ourselves, we've been through an awful lot in the last 20 plus weeks. And I dare say there's not a single one of us that have seen the Day of Atonement like we see it now. Amen. Not a single one of us have really seen what God has called us the Seventh-day Adventists to be as we have seen it now. And to be offered as part of sanctification mental power to be superior in every way to those around us because of the sanctification of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. To be able to make decisions and choices knowing that no matter if everyone else says you're crazy, you know the truth. That's a powerful thing. And the question we have to ask ourselves, have you counted the cost? Because God says, I have to have everything. Don't put me in a box. Don't give me 90%. Don't give me 96%. Give me everything. Everything means everything. Even your 100% your paycheck. Everything you own is God's. 
And we don't spend our money because it's our money. It's God's money. And He has given it to us to make sure that we spend it to bring glory and honor to His name. Amen. That everything we do is done in a way that will bring glory to Him. Otherwise, we're held accountable for it. So let us say, Lord, sanctify me that I may have the mental strength to keep you first. Mm -hmm. Is that your prayer? Mm -hmm. That's what I have. Let us kneel before the throne. Loving, merciful, and gracious Heavenly Father, you have clearly revealed to us that if we will submit unreservedly to your will, our minds, our bodies, everything about us with our character, all our strength that we have, that through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, you have promised to strengthen us with your omnipotence, that our wills will be so united with you our minds expanded to understand your will so clearly. Lord, we all desire that mental clearness in an age where everything is muddled up. Purify our lives, Lord. Glorify your name in our lives that we may go in this community and reveal you to those that we walk and commune with. That they will desire to be here in your house on your holy Sabbath day is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.